So we are now debating right now <clears throat> how many points I've given you after two messages on Lyle Baptist. And, uh, Hannah seems to think that I, I gave three points, but one was not a point, it was just a comment. So it was only a partial point. <laughs> all right, there are seven reasons why I said I'm a Baptist. I've not given you all those reasons, but I have jumped around a little bit, so some of it might be a little bit repetitive. So, let's take our Bibles. There are a couple passages I want to read to you. I will not go back to the passage in Acts where the Apostle Paul stands before uh, King Agrippa or before the, the rulers and says that he worshipped after the way they call heresy. I'm not going to do that. But understand, the reason for reading that lengthy passage and getting the setting in the courtroom and Paul making the comment that he did is the people that were accusing him of the crimes they were accusing him of are the same people that said he was a heretic. Baptists have always been known as heretics. Don't be alarmed by that. It is our enemies who call us heretics. It is also our enemies that give us the history of Baptists in their, in their own histories. The reason that we must go to the histories of other denominations particularly the Roman Catholic Church. The reason we must do that is because for 1,200 years, the Catholic Church persecuted Baptists to the death. They burned every book that was not Catholic. It did not matter if it was a secular book or a religious book. They burned everything, including the people. There's a reason why Baptist history is called the Trail of Blood. Because our history is written in blood. I've known preachers who have specialized in this area of Baptist history, and they make it their ministry, especially later in their years, once they're basically through with the pastoring the church, make it a ministry to travel from church to church, much like an evangelist would do. And they do nothing but preach on Baptist history. That may sound like a boring topic, but they know it so well and so thoroughly and present it so well, they spend entire weeks preaching on that topic and have a hard time exhausting it. There's that much history there. History was the first reason I gave you why I am a Baptist. Now, when I tell you this, it sounds like it's denominationalism that I'm preaching. I want to make sure I set that notion aside and just remind you that I'm not saying that you must be a Baptist to be saved. You understand what I'm saying? A person is saved through repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the two requirements on man's side that God requires for a person to be saved. Every Baptist is saved that way. Anybody who is not a Baptist, if they are saved, got saved the same way a Baptist did. There are no other ways to do that. What I'm saying is that every child of God is saved by repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Those are inseparable works of grace that God requires on our part before he will save us. They are a prerequisite to being saved. So I'm not saying you have to be a Baptist to be saved. But I am saying if you are saved, you ought to be a Baptist. I am not angry about that. I am not ashamed to state that. I'm not on a crusade, but I tell every child of God, anybody who has a sound profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I always ask them to tell me why they are what they are. Very few know why they go to the church they go to. Or if they do, it's usually an answer that is not a scriptural answer. 
It has no founding in Scripture. Oftentimes you hear people say, well, I like it there. I like the people. Or I like the singing. Oftentimes you'll hear, I like the preacher. I'm not saying those things are not important. I'm just saying that they are not the real reason why a person ought to be a member of a church. All of us ought to know why we are a Baptist. The scripture says in 1 Peter that we ought to be able to give an answer to every man that asks, asks of us the hope, the reason for the hope that lies within us. The reason we hold to what we do, we ought to have an answer for. That doesn't just come naturally. That comes through study. That comes through understanding it. Sometimes it comes through hearing information before it can be assimilated, taken in, remembered, and repeated to somebody else. So learn why you are a Baptist. That being said, I want you to go to the book of Deuteronomy tonight. There are four passages that I want to uh, introduce to you, and then I will go directly into the reasons why I'm a Baptist. I'm going to skip the history reason because I've already gone over it long enough. You ought to know something about your history, brethren. And if you don't, you need to find out. There's plenty of good material out there to teach you what your history is as a Baptist. In Deuteronomy 19, <clears throat> there is a verse that I want to read. The Mosaic Law, when Moses was giving the law to the children of Israel, once he got beyond the Ten Commandments, he began to break them down further and give uh, more minute details in what is called the Mosaic Law. One of the things he said in Deuteronomy 19 and verse 14, he said, Thou shalt not remove thy neighbor's landmark, which they of old time have set in thine inheritance, which thou shalt inherit in the land of that the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it. It becomes more strong a few chapters later in chapter 27, when Moses has instructed Joshua, when he leads the children of Israel into the promised land, they would come to a valley in which there were a mountain on one side and a mountain on the other. And Fritz will be able to tell you more about this because we've been actually looking at this a few weeks ago uh, in our discipleship class. Mount Ebal. What was the other one? Do you remember? Mount Sinai. I'm sorry? Mount Sinai. No, not Sinai. That's where the law was given. Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. A valley in between. Five miles apart with these two mountains. Long slopes on both sides. One half of the nation of Israel would be on one side. The other half, the other six tribes were on the other side. One on each mountain with a five-mile gap in between, all of the tribe of Levi, with the ark and the tabernacle, the holy things of God were assembled in the valley between them. And the priest says one man would read the entire law to the nation of Israel. It would be the cursings that the law gives, and that's what we're going to read just one verse out of here in a minute. And then they would read the, the blessings from the other side. And the one side when they read the cursings after every curse, the other side would say, Amen. And that would echo up and down that, that long valley, some 20 miles long. Now you think about 3 million people and that kind of a responsive reading. And that's quite impressive. And then the blessings, the other side would say, Amen to those. Quite an impressive showing for the Mosaic Law. Now, when we get to the cursings, we come to chapter 27, and those cursings begin. Uh, it tells you the setting in verse 12, and then we come down to verse 14. The Levites going to be speaking unto the, into the uh, all the men of Israel with a loud voice and so on. It gives the cursings beginning in verse 15. But in verse 17, it says, Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark. The earlier admonition by Moses was that they were not to remove the ancient landmarks that had been set before when the inheritance was given. They were not in the land at that time. 
Now coming into the land, very early before the division of the land, now really the conquering of the land was even, had even taken place, it was just shortly after Ai, Jericho and Ai, that this reading of the law took place, and the land was yet to be conquered before them. And so they still had their battles to fight. They still had their possessions ahead of them to possess. But when they got there, those possessions, or that land was divided up among the, not just the tribes of Israel, but down to the very families. When each man had his possession. It was to be marked with landmarks. There were to be stones or pillars or a post driven, something that would define the exact dimensions of what his inheritance was to be. And they were given a strict forbiddance to tamper with another man's landmark. That's how he made his livelihood. When we get over to the book of Job, in Job 24, verse 2, you don't have to turn there. Job says that he equates the removal of those ancient landmarks, and some would do that. He equates it to thievery, because that's exactly what it was. We have property stakes that are driven on any property that we own up here in the state of Alaska. We know exactly where they are, or we should. They might be hidden from sight, they might be under a lot of debris, but they're there. They tell us exactly where our property is and where those lines are for good reason. No one has the right to tamper with those landmarks. They're there for a reason. The book of Proverbs now, verse uh, in, in chapter 22, we have King Solomon, half a millennium later, after this event, in Deuteronomy, Solomon says this. It was a practice that they did in the nation of Israel. In Proverbs 22 and verse 28, he says, Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. And then in chapter 23 and verse 10, Remove not the old landmark and enter not into the fields of the fatherless. And so we see several occasions, there are more than these in Scripture, but that's the bulk of them. We find the importance of the landmarks being identified and not tampered with because it establishes who has what as far as property goes in the nation of Israel. So you might be thinking, what in the world does this have to do with the topic of why I'm a Baptist? There are landmarks that we hold to that clearly identify us as Baptists. There are peculiarities that we hold to that nobody else on the face of the earth believes. There are specific doctrines and beliefs that clearly identify us as a Baptist and not as a Protestant. Now, I say that for a reason. When I was 17 years old, I joined the United States Army. They marched us through long lines in our underwear and gave us more shots than I care to remember. And then we came to a certain station and they asked us what religion we were. Now I was a Christian at that time, but I knew very little about what it meant to be a Baptist. So I basically just claimed to be non-denominational, a Protestant. And they said, we have one of three choices. You can either call yourself a Jew, so you were Jewish, or you were a Catholic, or you were a Protestant. Well, I'm glad they just said, put Protestant on my dog tags. That way, if I fell in battle somewhere and, and needed to be identified as what kind of a service needed to be held for me, it'd be a Protestant service. That was about the extent of what I knew about what I should be. It was not until two years later I found out you did not have to take that slot that they offered. You could actually tell the fellow, no, there's another one you can put in there. You can put Baptist on my dog tags. And if they wanted to claim it was being a Protestant, they could easily be corrected if you knew your own history, which I did not know at that time. Two years later, I did know. And ever since that day, I'm not ashamed to say I'm a Baptist, and I do not... I do not have a problem defending why I'm a Baptist. I'm a Baptist because history 
is one of the great landmarks that we can point to that clearly identifies us as being in existence dating all the way back to the days of Jesus Christ. We will address that more a little bit later in this message, not from a historical standpoint, but from a biblical standpoint. <clears throat> there was a second point that Hannah was kind enough to pick up on. I do not know exactly when I preached it, but it was definitely in my notes somewhere, and she picked up on it. And that second point says that I'm a Baptist because Baptists are Bible believers. Now, that's a pretty easy claim to make, isn't it? Who doesn't claim to be a Bible believer? You could ask a Mormon, and they would tell you they are Bible believers. Gray of a statement. The Baptists are the only people in the history of Christendom that have never taken anything except the Bible as their only rule of faith and practice. Understand what those terms mean. When I say it is the rule of our faith, I'm talking about our beliefs. It is the only thing that settles what we believe. We do not write creeds. We do not write long statements or defenses of something. We simply take the Bible. Now, don't misunderstand me. I didn't say we don't have a doctrinal statement that clearly, succinctly states what we believe. But you'll find that even in that state statement that collates our particular beliefs, it gives scripture at every turn. It points to the Bible as being what determines what we believe and why we believe it. <coughs> the other point, when I say Baptists are Bible believers, it settles what we believe, meaning our doctrine of belief or those set of beliefs that identify us as what we are. And likewise, it settles what we practice. I'm looking at an audience right now, and most of the people of reading age have a Bible in their lap or in their hands. Why is that? What are you guys, a bunch of Bible nuts or something? Well, if you are, it's because you're a Baptist. Because you want to see if what I say stacks up with what God said in his word. And that is the insistence in a Baptist church. That, that's what we want you to do. Bring that book and see if it ain't so. Now, I had to get a master's degree before I could make that kind of a statement. It didn't teach me any English. But it got the thought across. We are Baptists by faith and by our practice. It dictates to us, that book dictates to us what our practice is as well as what our beliefs are. That is a Bible believing church. Now, let's go a bit further. <coughs> I believe the last time I preached on this, I kind of left you hanging on this point, this third point, and that's probably why you've got a partial system there, or you just weren't paying attention, and I finished getting this forgotten. The truth of the matter is this. I'm a Baptist because the Baptist name is God-given. Now, does that sound like denominationalism? Some would say yes. But the fact of the matter is, if you go to John, not to Matthew chapter 3, we will have this name given to us in Scripture. In John chapter 3 and verse 1, I say John, I'm sorry, I meant Matthew. If you made it to John, that's okay. We're going to go there next. <laughs> In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1, 
It says, in those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, or Isaiah, as we also hear it, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. This same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, that's the river, not the country, and were baptized of him in Judea, or in Jordan, confessing their sins. So in those six verses, we read that there's a man sent from God whose name is John. That is the God-given name for this individual that was given him through the angel that was sent to his father Zechariah before he was even conceived. Now in this chapter, we have John coming on the scene as a grown man and beginning his public ministry. He did not begin until he was 30 years old in Jewish society. And he is preaching a message that all of us should be able to relate to because it's a Bible message. He's out in the wilderness, which doesn't mean out in the woods. It means he's out of this civilized area of the towns, and he's at the crossroads where all the caravans would come through. He's at the watering places where they'd water their stock, and they would congregate to refill their, their bottles of water before they travel on. Ideal places to preach to large groups of people. And then his preaching, we see his message. I mean, what would a man like John have to say to lost people? Repent. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is, the king is about to appear. The king being the Messiah. And so he was calling upon the people to repent for their wickedness. And remember what the qualifications are, the, re the requisites are for salvation. That is repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he preached about immediate repentance and a faith in a soon-to-appear Messiah. That is the gospel message. You never want to meet God unprepared. That speaks of the immediacy, of the importance of being prepared for eternity. Because eternity is what all of us face. And it does not make one difference how old we are. The first funeral I preached was for a two week old baby. It makes no difference. Death is no respecter of persons. Being prepared and ready is the message of the first Baptist preacher. Now notice it. In those days, in verse 1, came John the Baptist. Now that term, the Baptist, is not a name that he's bearing. That is a title that he was given. He was not called the Baptist. Look, back, the word Baptist doesn't mean the immerser. He had not immersed anybody in John chapter 3 until you come to verse 6 or 7. And it says, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, meaning the Jordan River. And they were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. We see repentance and faith taking place and baptism taking place immediately after that. That is a Baptist practice, by the way. A person who would be, who would want to be a member of a Baptist church must first have a biblical salvation testimony. 
that is a testimony that stacks up against scripture, measures up. Then they're a proper candidate for baptism, just as these people were. And so when I say that we have a God-given name, if anybody in the history of Christendom has a right to claim that, Baptists do. God called him the Baptist before he baptized anybody, not because he baptized, but because of the work God sent him to do. And that was to preach repentance towards God and faith toward a redeemer or a savior that was soon to step foot on the scene. And then he baptized them. So who invented baptism? Where did such a thing come from? I've had Protestant friends that have told me many years ago when that question was brought up, <coughs> And in some of the Protestant writings I had read back when I was much younger, many of them tried to force Bible baptism in the New Testament to the Levitical washings in the Old Testament. And the two do not equate. There is no such thing as baptism in the Old Testament. The ceremonial washing of the priests at the tabernacle and later at the temple do not equate to New Testament baptism. They do not even resemble each other. One, you're washing yourself in. The other, you are immersed in. Completely different practices that represent completely different things. So it still begs the question, where then did baptism come from? This man called John. Does anybody know anything about the history of this man? His birth is very unique. It's a miraculous birth. <laughs> no only parents were beyond childbearing years. Zacharias, his father, was a Levitical priest. His son John was born of the tribe of Levi and likewise would have been a Levitical priest. All of his training for his entire early development and education would center around one thing and one thing only, and that was to become a Levitical priest. And yet he never served one day as a priest. We do find that he comes out of the wilderness. He spends much time studying that Old Testament out in that wilderness. He's already learned it forward and backward as a priest. And then his studying, he has learned that the Messiah that is to come and that they all longed for was to be a suffering Messiah. You see in the Old Testament, you see not two Messiahs, but you see the picture. You see two pictures of one Messiah. One, he is a suffering, dying Messiah for the sins of the people. And the other picture presents him as a king that rules from the throne of his father, David. Both pictures are accurate. Both pictures are prophetic of not only his work in one case, but likewise his coming reign that is yet future in the other case. While he does not sit upon the throne of his father David yet, I assure you the scripture tells us plainly that the day will come that he will come a second time and he will sit upon that throne and literally rule Israel with a lot of iron. Many who have absolute authority. And that is what will usher in what is called the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. He will reign for a thousand years. We don't have time to go into that right now. But both pictures are given to us. And John, in his reflections upon the scripture, his study of the scripture, recognizes that when he comes, he will come to die, not to reign. And in that death, 
there was enough revelation in the Old Testament given to state that he had been buried when he died, but then he rises again from the dead. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is clearly foretold multiple times in your Old Testament. And as he studied his Old Testament, he learned this. And God gave him what was to become a New Testament ordinance that our Lord himself would adopt as an ordinance for the church that he would start. And that is called baptism. He is the first to do it. He was the inventor of it by the very hand of God. And he was the first to practice it. Now, we'll talk more about that in just a little while. But the work that the Baptist had to do goes along. It's the same point that I'm trying to make, that even though we have a God-given name, he is called a Baptist, not because he baptized, but because of the complete picture of what his work entailed. He made converts by preaching repentance and faith toward the Messiah. That is the same message that we preach today whereby sinners are saved. Baptism is simply the ordinance that the church <coughs> placed in the church to publicly allow that convert to act out what he or she believes. Going down in that water pictures the death and the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. And coming up out of that water pictures the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is symbolic in nature only. It does not save anybody. It cannot save anybody. But what does save is the gospel itself, which is the death, burial, and resurrection. So he was an early gospel preacher. He had the picture right. He understood the scriptures accurately in portraying a suffering Messiah. So I'm a Baptist. Yeah, because this, he, we have a God-given name, but likewise, but because of the work that God gave that first Baptist to do, it's the same work we have today. I believe I left you at this point with the Lord Jesus. This is a several Sundays ago when I preached the second time on this topic. I left you with a question that Jesus asked the religious rulers of his day in Matthew, uh, I forget if it's 21 or somewhere in that neighborhood, he says, the baptism of John, was it of God or was it of men? And they could not answer him because it would put them in a compromising position. They knew the truth. They did not buy into the truth. They simply said, we cannot tell. And so he told them, I will not tell you the authority by which I do the things I do then either. I don't know if you guys remember that passage. No, you ought to read it. Because that is really the question right there. And I would ask anybody, anywhere, at any time, who wants to argue this matter of baptism, or what is biblical baptism, I'd ask them, the baptism of John. Is it of God or is it of man? The obvious implication is that it was of God. That is the only biblical answer you can give. God is the one that revealed it to John in his study of the Old Testament, how he would show a picture of what the gospel would be. I am also a Baptist, and I guess we ought to turn in the scriptures over to Acts chapter 1 for this next point. Now, this would be... I don't know, maybe it's the fourth point or so. In Acts chapter 1, I'm going to read if I get there, I'm going to read from verses 15 to the end of the chapter. Acts 1 and verse 15. This is the point that I want to make, and you can look for this as we read it. I'm a Baptist because every one of the apostles were Baptists. Did you hear me? I 
I hope you're thinking, you better prove that point in the room. Because we're going to go to the scripture and show you that that's exactly what it teaches. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 15, we have Peter standing before uh, the multitude in the upper room. And he says this in verse 15. And in those days, this is the days just prior to the day of Pentecost, which ha happens in Acts chapter 2. But it's after the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. There were 10 days that took place from the time that he ascended into heaven and to the day of Pentecost. The days he's referring to are in that time period of 10 days. He told them to abide in the upper room and tarry there until they were endued with power from on high. And this is what takes place at some point during those 10 days. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120. So how many people were there? We have a church rule already of 120. Verse 16, men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Jesus which was guide to them that took Jesus, uh, concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry, meaning Judas Iscariot, the betrayer of Jesus Christ, had been foretold back in the book of Psalms what he would do. And in the book of Psalms, it tells there that one would be taking his place now this man, <clears throat> verse 17, for he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry, meaning an apostleship. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and fallen headlong. He burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. Now, I know this sounds gory and I'm not going to try to go into any detail. You get the idea. Do not fall under the silly assumption that this man went out and hanged himself with a rope it does say he hung himself, he hung himself, but not with a rope. It's an oriental hanging. It is a hanging that the Japanese would call it Harry Carey. He's a man that went out and he fell headlong, meaning he fell upon his sword and cut himself open. And that is why his bowels would gush out. He was not the first to do it. Saul did it as well, if you recall in the Old Testament. There are some others who did that as well. Of course, in recent history, there have been many that have committed such, such an act. So, we have again, here in verse um, 18, that he took the money he betrayed, betrayed the Lord Jesus with the 30 pieces of silver, and he purchased a field with that money. In the same field, he would not commit suicide by falling on his sword. And it was known unto all, in verse 19, it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field, <clears throat> it's called in their proper tongue Asodama, that is to say the field of blood, it was a bloody mess in other words for it was written in the book of Psalms let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein and his bishopric let another take and notice what Peter is instructing them of he's saying that in the book of Psalms it states that the field he buys will be desolate, meaning no one's going to live in that field, what did the priests do with it? They buried him there. They said because it was a, a field much blood had been shed that they would make it into a cemetery for foreigners who had died when they came to Jerusalem. And so it became a graveyard. That's a pretty fitting field right there for the contents that were buried there. And then he goes on to say that when that happens, though, he says when he's gone and out of the way, let another one be chosen to fill the position that he vacated. And now look at verse 21. <clears throat> Here's the qualifications to be an apostle. Wherefore, these men, he's pointing to some men right there, two men in particular. Wherefore, these men, which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, under that same day that he, meaning Jesus, was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness 
with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph and Barsabas, two men in that congregation of 120 that qualified because they began with the baptism of John and accompanied with them the entire time that Jesus had his personal ministry on the earth until the Lord was ascended or taken up. That was a qualification to be an apostle. Both these men qualified. In verse 23, they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was served in justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, meaning they cast their votes. And the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Now, I'm going I'm to chase a rabbit just a minute. I want you to stay with me. You will notice there that by inspiration of the Spirit of God, we have recorded for us that there were 11 apostles. See that in the very last phrase, the last verse? He was numbered with the 11. There used to be 12. One is now dead and gone, and he must be replaced. He was a lost hypocrite. Matthias was nominated by that church to replace Judas Iscariot. Now, I've had people argue with me, and they would say, well, you know, Peter here, being the big mouth Peter that he was, and being the rash and irrational man that he was at times, the impetuous man who meant well, but just seemed to always stumble when he tried to do the right thing. Good old Peter got ahead of the Lord right here. And what's more, jump the gun. Because Paul should have been the 12th apostle, not Matthias. And Paul himself calls himself an apostle, appointed by God. Peter's not even mentioned in that debate. But let me just remind you that a careful reading of the Word of God will reveal that Paul was not the 12th apostle. Although he was an apostle, he was the 13th if there was one. And he was the apostle to the Gentiles. This man was going to be an apostle to the Jews. He's numbered with the 11. And I want you to go from there all the way over to the book of Acts, chapter 6, and read with me. Now listen, we're talking about the inspiration of the word of God. Every single word is given by God. In Acts chapter 6, before Paul even enters the picture. It says in Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. And just to remind you, that if every, word of the, if every word of your Bible is inspired by the Spirit of God, and it is, the Lord himself recognized that as a valid business meeting and recognized Matthias as the 12th apostle, and he is called the 12th in this passage. Now, that rabbit's been caught, so I'm going to move on. The apostles were all Baptists. They had to be. We just read the qualifications for an apostle in Acts chapter 1. They had to have been accompanying. Uh, beginning with the baptism of John, they had John's baptism. That, my friend, is Baptist baptism. They were converts of John the Baptist, and they were likewise baptized by John the Baptist, and then because his ministry only lasted six months, by the way, they were all pointed to the Messiah when the Messiah stepped on the scene. And I mean, within a month, John was empty-handed, and the Lord inherited the material that the Lord had prepared to start his first church. They were called the apostles. Does this make sense at all? Are we, are we together? 
Each one of these apostles was saved and baptized under John's ministry, according to Acts chapter 1. Let me just say this as a conclusion on that point. If they had Baptist baptism, then they were Baptists. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> I've got time. I'm going to put it till 8 o'clock, okay? Got nine minutes. You think I can get three points in nine minutes? You're laughing. You're not, you're not, you don't even take me serious. Fifth. The fifth reason why I'm a Baptist. The Bible itself is a Baptist book. Not only do Baptists believe the Bible, but the Bible will make people Baptists. The following thing, the two are related to one another. The New Testament is a book, is a Baptist book. It was written by Baptists and for Baptists. Hear me? Every one of these books, with the exception of two, were written by the apostles. Mark was written by John Mark, a nephew to Barnabas. Luke and Acts were written by Luke, who was a Gentile physician, who was Paul's personal physician on his missionary journeys. All the rest of these books were written by the apostles. The apostle Paul, the, the, the apostle to the Gentiles, wrote 13 of these books. Most of them were written to Baptist churches. All you have to do is read the first verse of each one of the books he wrote, and almost always you will see Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. Or unto the church at Ephesus, or unto the churches, plural, of Galatia, speaking of a region. Most of them are church epistles written to Baptist churches that he had founded. My father-in-law used to be quite fond of saying that every newborn child of God starts out as a Baptist until somebody messes him up. There's probably some truth in that. Because I believe personally in my heart that if we could take a Bible, and I will just call the King James Bible for the sake of, of our society, if you could take a King James Bible with no footnotes in it, no men's opinions, You're holding one of those Bibles, so I'll have to trust you. I think it's up in the apostle book. If you were to take the King James Bible that you have, with no footnotes, nothing that man has put in there to try to help us understand you know, his point of view, and we were to give it to a, a newborn Christian, and you put him aside for a year and let him just read. And study that book. The Spirit of God being his teacher, he would come out of there believing what you and I believe as Baptists. I believe that. I did not say he will have the depth of understanding because he won't have the years you had to sit in there sound preaching. But his basic beliefs will line up with what a sound Baptist believes in this day and age. It's a Baptist book, brethren, written by Baptists for Baptists, and it makes Baptists. People are going to be true to the book to come out believing what Baptists believe. The last two points I will give to you, I will not spend a lot of time on them. They are by far, even though I give them the least, the least amount of attention, they are by far the better two points in my opinion. I'm a Baptist because Jesus himself started a Baptist church. You hear enough about the church, the doctrine of the church, 
in this assembly to understand that to some degree. So I won't, you, I won't belabor the point. But Jesus himself is the first one to use the term church in Matthew 16, 18, when he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he went on and built that church. Now there are many that, many of Protestantism that want to claim that the church Jesus built was a future church. And it was a universal church, including all the saved of all the ages, both Old Testament and New Testament. Some make it smaller, some make it bigger, some put different contingencies on it, but it's all the same basic idea. All the saved of all the ages belong to that universal church because it, it's everywhere. Some's in heaven, some's here on earth, some's over the other side of the earth. It includes all the believers of all time. And it's invisible because it's spiritual in nature. You can't see it. It's not the true church. That's how C.I. Schofield likes, likes to call it the true church, being this universal, invisible church. Let me just say something to you about that. The church was universal, that is, it's everywhere. You couldn't find it. And if it was invisible, you'd have even a harder task at hand because you couldn't see it. You wouldn't know it if you were in the middle of it. The terms are contradictory. They do not really stack up what the scripture says. There are churches that are local, which is what we are right here, and they are visible, which you can see and be a part of, hear the word of God preached in, and that is exactly what Jesus was talking about. He said, I will build my church. He had already started his church. He, now he was going to expand it. Back in the 80s, there was a guy named Lee Iacocca. Some of you might know the name, some of you may not. He's probably just a historical figure for most of you. But he was actually alive at some point when I was alive. And uh, this man took Chrysler Corporation, became the, the president of Chrysler Corporation, the CEO, and Chrysler had gone absolutely bankrupt, almost went out of existence back in the 80s. And I mean, the, the nation was not in favor of bailing them out. I mean, they, they, were, they were bankrupt. The government was talking about bailing them out, and Lee Iacocca went in, and he said, no, we don't want to bail out. He said, we're going to turn this organization into a profitable business. And for a while, he was a laughingstock in the financial world. But he did exactly what he said. If Lee Iacocca got up and said, I will build Chrysler Corporation, no one would have thought that Chrysler did not exist. It was already in existence. It just wasn't profitable. Rather, they would understand that what he's saying is he's going to expand it. He's going to make it a profitable, booming enterprise. He's going to build Chrysler not only in Detroit, which is where it was located. He's also going to build a Chrysler plant over here in know, Memphis, Tennessee. He's going to build one over here in, in Princeton, New Jersey. He's going to build one maybe over in Carmichael, California. And he might name different locations. He's going to start new plants and expand that business so it becomes profitable throughout the nation. In that sense, he's talking about the future expansion of it. And so when we hear the Lord say, I will build my church, he might be speaking about the future expansion of that. But he's going to build churches just like that first churches all over the world. And that's going to be the very mission what that first church is to do is to reproduce themselves in other locations listen the first church now listen to me the first church before we get to the book of acts on the day of pentecost we have a church of saved baptized people with a church full of 120 it's spoken of in acts chapter one they had a church treasurer now, he was a thief he was also the treasurer appointed by the lord himself they had church officers in that Peter was their first pastor when the Lord left, appointed by the Lord himself. Not a pope, just the pastor of a local Baptist church is all he was. They had a place to meet in Jerusalem in the upper room. We see them gathered there just before the day of Pentecost. They had a commission from the Lord. The great commission that was given at the end of Matthew chapter 28. They had ordinances placed in the church by the Lord himself. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. 
That church was all in existence. Every one of those things were in existence before the day of Pentecost because he built his church. He would not leave it to another to do it. He would build it, which is exactly what he did. I'm a Baptist because our Lord built a Baptist church. And finally, I'm one minute over, finally, the seventh point. I'm a Baptist because the Lord Jesus Christ himself was a Baptist. Do you understand what I'm saying here? I'm not trying to be big. I'm just stating the historical fact. The scripture says that Jesus went to John as he was baptized there in the Jordan River. And he, in John chapter, you see it, in Matthew chapter 4, you see it. When Jesus comes to John and says, he came to be baptized of John in the River Jordan. And John forbade him saying, I have need to be baptized of you. Why don't you come to me? And Jesus said, Suffer it to be so for now. But thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, it was the right thing to do. He was not going to ask anybody to do that ordinance that he himself did not do. He set the example. Now we're in 1 Peter. We are told that our Lord suffered. And he left us an example that we should follow in his steps. Now, Jesus walked over 60 miles from Nazareth all the way down to Anon in Jordan. On, by foot, he goes down there to be baptized by the first Baptist preacher. I think we are obligated to get the same baptism that he got. That's the kind of example he sat. Of he sat. Now, If our Lord went to the first Baptist to be baptized, there was absolutely no reason why every follower of Jesus Christ should not follow the Lord and receive the same baptism. Now notice, now I'm not trying to be ugly here, but this is notice something. He did not go to John Knox to be baptized in the Presbyterians. He did not go to John Calvin to be baptized by the Swiss Presbyterians. He did not go to Martin Luther to be baptized by the Lutherans. He did not go to Henry VIII to be baptized by the Episcopalians and he found it. He did not go to any of the popes to be baptized in the Catholic Church. Why is that? We can go right down to, he didn't go to the Wesley brothers for Methodism. What are we saying here? You're saying that none of them existed. Our Lord went to the first Baptist to be baptized by a Baptist preacher and demonstrated in his own baptism exactly what he would perform for every sinner that's been on the face of the earth. And that was his death, burial, and resurrection, which is exactly what Bible baptism pictures. All right, I'm going to stop. I'm at five over. I open five on Sunday. You probably won't get it this Sunday, but I will try to remember that. Well, I appreciate your patience with me on this.